hello to one of the very last sessions of Holy Tish. My name is Thomas and I'm here with Luciana Bianchi who will in just a minute introduce herself. But before we go there, allow me some organizational and final remarks. So after um, this session, I believe at four o'clock, we will be starting our harvesting session where we try to conclude all the input, all the learnings, the takeaways you made, we made during the three days of, of Holy Tish. And we would be super happy if you would be joining us in the harvesting session to, to gather your feedback and to create something that is lasting. Um, apart from that, one final note, many of you will have heard it before, but uh, we are very looking forward or would be very happy to get 100 subscribers on YouTube so that we can have a nice channel name, the YouTube slash uh, Holy Tish, instead of this randomized uh, character, character thingy that we currently have. So if you would be so kind and subscribe on YouTube, we would be very happy. That is enough self-promotion at this point. And... Um, we are going to talk in this session about reinventing gastronomy in the midst of a crisis. And I think, Luciana, you are one of maybe one of the best people in the entire world to talk about this subject. And that has a lot to do with what you are doing and what you have done in your life. So I don't know how many of our of our viewers know you. So therefore, I would kindly ask you to give us a, a summary of, of who you are, what you've done and why you care so much about gastronomy and its future. Um, hi, Thomas. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all to uh, watching us here. And I hope that you support this event because it's an event that is dealing with very important topics. And I think it's a great opportunity to talk about uh, things that truly matter in gastronomy. So thank you for having me. Um, talking about myself, um, well, uh, I think uh, most of all, I'm a food lover. And I come from a family that has a great tradition of uh, loving food and dedicating their time and life to food. So um, there's nobody's food professional in my family, but they were all completely obsessed about food. Mm -hmm. So uh, I grew up thinking that uh, the most important thing uh, in life is, is food and is, uh, most things are solved good and bad things around the table. So for me, it was kind of a natural having a parallel career in gastronomy, even though I was lost for many years, as probably many young people are right now. Mm -hmm. So don't lose hope. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I didn't know that uh, food uh, as a profession was an option. But because food was all, always around, somehow uh, organically, uh, things are starting to develop, and I realized uh, starting with a career of business studies that uh, I failed completely because I wasn't interested. I did a few years of business studies, and then after that, I started to look for options, and then I realized maybe hospitality is something I like because I love to host people. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, making the story short, basically, uh, I made a career in the past 20 years uh, combining uh, cooking as a, a formal trained chef. And uh, then I went to a study related to uh, molecular science because I realized in the time that Ferran Adria started to talk about science in the kitchen, how ignorant I was about, uh, about science. Mm -hmm. And my studies were very, very weak in that matter. So I combined uh, to my, my cooking uh, abilities, I, I, I combined science, and then I started to develop a whole career uh, in writing. I come from a family of writers, so uh, I think it was always there. I always loved to write. So I uh, started to write, cook, and uh, travel, and do all things around gastronomy in a kind of, uh, I would say, kind of a unique profession because it didn't exist that type of profession at the time. So we are a bunch of people uh, who are um, promoting and discovering the world of gastronomy. And at the end, we, uh, we participate of this great moment where uh, the chefs who are now celebrities were not celebrities. And yeah, so we were traveling with them, we we're visiting them in restaurants. And so 
that is a little bit my my background as a kind of a traveler. So let me ask one question out of curiosity, because e even now you see much less women chefs than than uh, or you see much less women chefs than men chefs but but how was it for yeah. you especially because i think reading reading about you that you worked in some of the very best uh, kitchens during your lifetime and uh, how was it as a as a woman in these kitchens and has it changed oh as uh, being a, being a woman is being difficult since the world exists and uh, is still very uh, dif very difficult however i would not uh, ex the place of any man in this world <laughs> but what i can say i mean i was in germany 14 years so uh, gross oh, alles <laughs> And uh, yeah, um, I had a, a, I would say the beginning of my career as a chef was in Germany. And uh, even though I think it was the hardest time, um, the most difficult time, mm -hmm. because I couldn't speak a, a good German in the beginning, at the end, I was, I was able then to express my thoughts and uh, in my views. So um, I would say that uh, uh, this is a profession that is very hard physically. And the fact that a woman uh, have babies uh, may uh, becomes a, a kind of a, a, I would say a barrier for many employers. Mm -hmm. However, um, I in Germany I I, I was uh, proving that it is possible because I had a baby. I was a chef in a restaurant cooking tasting menu until I was eight months and ten days. And after that, I delivered my baby. And after six months, I came back to go back to work. So mm -hmm. um, for me, it was very important at the time to uh, show people that uh, uh, being a woman and having a baby is not being sick. So uh, you have to respect and first that if there are men in the kitchen is because a woman delivered them. So it's part of the society to find a balance and to, um, first of all, realize that uh, competence uh, is independent of gender. I know great women who are great chefs, and I know great men who are great chefs. And uh, when I see uh, someone saying a chef, a chef for me uh, is someone who can manage their skills. And, uh, and I don't think gender is irrelevant, to be honest. It I like your story a lot, and to be to be very uh, honest here, uh, it reminds me a lot of my mom's story. She hasn't been a chef. My dad was a chef, and my mom was working uh, as a uh, initially in, in service and later <laughs> as a hotel director. But yeah, she did the, the the very same thing. And I have childhood memories when I was like half a year or a year. The, these you know these very short snippets of memory where I'm in one of the rooms where nothing is happening, and my mom is w working the service, and I'm just sleeping in my little kitchen bed uh, in the restaurant and uh -huh. it was all possible i mean in in german we have this saying wo ein wille ist ist auch ein weg where you where you want to achieve something yeah. there is always a, a yeah. path and uh, yeah i think uh, that is a good story so let's probably get a bit into the area of discussion that we want to talk about um, reinventing gastronomy in times of a crisis so i think there are there are several elements to the title alone because on the one hand so why should we reinvent gastronomy and what is the which role does the crisis play in this current situation i think that we have to talk about uh, um, a crisis uh, before covid and after covid Mm -hmm. um, I think gastronomy was going through a crisis already before the COVID. So uh, I think the COVID, in fact, is a great opportunity. Uh, I think it's an existential crisis because um, uh, what happened is that uh, uh, we passed through a moment where image start to become far more important than reality and uh, in this whole culture of star chefs was out of control. Uh, I think a lot of people start to engage with the world of gastronomy for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, gastronomy starts to become an entertainment like any other entertainment in the whole world of TV with master chefs and iron chefs and all the TV shows. Uh, we're a great platform to expose gastronomy and to open new doors to producers and to new talents. But at the same time, it was a great stage for superficialities. So I think mm -hmm. that it was a time, a crisis time, 
uh, in which uh, everything what was relevant to us started to be a bit questioned uh, uh, because we are seeing that uh, uh, people are giving too much focus to the superficial. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we were a group of people who fight so many years for the deep meaning of gastronomy, you know? I mean, not just traveling, but open doors. I remember to when travel you say, sometimes. When you, say, when you say we were a group of people fighting for it, so who is yeah. that we? Can you, can you give me an idea of what is Nina, the group you're yeah, talking about? Yeah, I think it's when I talk we, I talk people like myself that uh, 20 years ago started this journey uh, where... Uh, Basically, there were restaurants, they were not kind of star chefs or uh, re iconic restaurants that people were traveling to visit. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we, a group of uh, chefs, food lovers, journalists, uh, what we started doing uh, was uh, basically um, turning our free time and our all possible time mm -hmm. into uh, a gastro journey. So we are a bit like a missionaries, you know, uh, traveling around to visit restaurants, like, for example, Noma Open. And then we start to visit to see what was the big deal of the restaurant mm -hmm. and in some level support this chef by telling people you have to go there. You have to visit this place. It is worth it traveling just to eat there. And this whole idea of gastro traveling didn't exist at the time. Nobody was traveling to a place to visit a restaurant. The restaurant was a place where people were hungry and they were eating. And maybe there were great iconic restaurants like Paul Bocuse. However, most of the places uh, were there to serve people when they were traveling to know the place. But mm -hmm. uh, what we were start doing was to change things around. It's telling people uh, you have to go there to visit the restaurant or then later even to visit this producer. So uh, it was like a life mission, really. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then when the world's 50 best restaurants started, we are a group of people that were part of this academy, uh, like as volunteers, and, and truly traveling, visiting restaurants and rating restaurants to uh, uh, show people that uh, there was something happening and there was something new happening, that creativity was taking over some places. And they were, they were going to be the influencers of the future of gastronomy. So it was a time that the gastronomy, as we see now, was starting to be reshaped. I, I mean, just to make, just to give our listeners who might not be aware. So you were, I, I think you were even on the, on the voting board of the first uh, 50 best restaurant list, right? So first, because nobody can know who was in the voting board of the 50 best restaurants. Okay. <laughs> and the thing is, in, uh, 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 now who is in the voting board of the uh, is total secret. But at the time, of course, we were a very small group and people knew because uh, first, in the beginning, nobody took very seriously the whole uh, matter of 50 best because it was mm -hmm. a small uh, group of people and... Uh, and we were a lot more like a group of friends trying to promote good gastronomy. And then nobody thought that these things were going to become this iconic, Something. huge company. company. And of course, uh, then uh, the rules start to be a little bit more, uh, you know, strict. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and basically, we're doing that. We're traveling, discovering places, uh, recommending to people where to go. Uh, but what's an act of love? Nobody ever paid us. 50 Best never paid for any single person to do that. We were a group of real food lovers who were doing that uh, just because mm -hmm. we want to shape gastronomy uh, and make people believe that it was worth it traveling to visit those places. Yeah, I, I mean, having, like I said before, this this entire industry in my, in my family, even though prof professionally I, I didn't want to touch it as a child. And so, I mean, maybe at, at some point I have some concepts in my mind that I would like to do it at, at a certain point. Cur currently I don't, but uh, yeah, I, 
I know there was a point in time, I mean, as a German chef, my, my dad, wh where did he go to for, for learning when he was an ambitious young chef in the, in the um, yeah, 70s and 80s? Well, you look to France, right? You look to France, you went there, and it was just a generation where, where probably e even a generation later than in France where you had Bocuse and, and uh, all, the big, all the big chefs, but then suddenly people here started to to really care about cooking but the clientele at least I, I have a German perspective on this industry right the, the the guests really had to be developed to to appreciate yeah everything that goes into into cooking eating and doing a restaurant where you have to spend not only a lot of time but a lot of love and then you create something that is that is great that is communal that is to be shared mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think so. so the the way I, I see it, you were really one of the people early on driving a development to a different kind of restaurant. Somebody who really cares about the craft and all, even the art of what they are doing. But 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 then you said initially <laughs> we are in even before COVID we were facing an existential crisis. So, so yeah, what is the pre? I mean, just a, a little a, a little bracket in in between. Uh, I think uh, uh, Germany after France, Germany was the country that was the quickest country to find out the importance of uh, uh, learning uh, classic skills and uh, in in terms of uh, uh, hot cuisine. Uh, was immediately after France because uh, people like uh, Eckhard Witzmann uh, was the, they were the great mm -hmm. pupils uh, uh, of uh, of top uh, French chefs and and so uh, I think for me as well to have the opportunity uh, to be a chef to learn uh, in in Germany and to be in Germany uh, at the time was great because uh, I was uh, uh, it was clear for me. That something was happening, and, uh, and in the 90s, that is the time I was in Germany, was the time mm -hmm. then that things started to shift to another place that was Spain. So mm -hmm. uh, at the time uh, before I arrived, all German chefs were in France, and most people who want to learn great skills were in France. And then after, when the whole creativity started in the new perspective about cuisine and, and mixing science in the kitchen, and then the whole shift was uh, to Spain. Mm -hmm. So uh, about your question uh, uh, before COVID. So I think the crisis was this existential crisis in the sense of uh, how can we balance what is real from all this celebrity world. So uh, uh, many chefs start to become marks, uh, names like brands like mm -hmm. Gucci, like, uh, you know, Armani. Sure. And uh, the chef was not in the kitchen anymore. And the chef was a, a kind of the face of the restaurant. But uh, uh, we're doing more a show than uh, doing uh, what uh, chefs used to do in the past, that be in the kitchen and cooking. By doing that, this brand gives the possibility to people experience, uh, like uh, you can buy a cloth for Armani that was not made by Armani, but was approved by Armani. So uh, the world so, but of... Let, mm -hmm. let, let me... Up hop in here with a question because I really wonder and you know many more of these chefs I, I, I assume personally than, than I do is this development mostly driven by, by the drive to be famous and to be in the spotlight or is it because they see it generally or, or it's even required to, to maintain the business because it's such a tough business to be in what is your diagnosis here? I think it is a mix, and, and in my case, I make an analysis because I was a private chef for big celebrities for many years, and uh, so I start to make a comparative about rock stars that I know very well and uh, uh, the people from the gastronomy world. So mm -hmm. fame ca comes uh, in different ways, and uh, uh, it is an organic process. Nobody's prepared for fame. Uh, a, a rock star or a chef, uh, when he started his profession, he started usually because they love the profession and uh, they want to be famous, you know, um, because uh, that is the result of uh, success in their profession. Mm -hmm. So becoming famous for a chef or for a rock star, it means people like what I'm doing. However, the side effects of fame, nobody's prepared for. A rock star is not prepared. And a chef is not prepared. 
And how that fame arrives to your door is also different from one person to another. So there are people that start to build organically uh, this uh, work and then uh, people will start to see them as an iconic figure. Uh, but there are some people that go to TV next day cannot go out of the street anymore. So fame is uh, something very difficult uh, because uh, not all people know how to deal with. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if you are prepared, uh, it is not easy too because in some level, the way people see you is more the way they construct you in their mind. So you have to deal with this kind of a fictional character and this fictional character becomes you, yeah. you know, and that is the person who is there for the world. So that affects you, affects your family, affects the way you work and it started sometimes to affect the way you perceive yourself. So there are some people who are had feet in the ground, very, you know, they're very stable psychologically. They are, uh, they don't have a tendency to egocentrism or narcissism, but there are some people who like the attention. Maybe they didn't have much attention beforehand. Sure. Maybe they were like the ugly ducklings in the school, you know, and then suddenly if everyone starts to say you are sexy and you are cool, you are hot or you are so good. And I truly don't care about your food, but I am a fan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, which <laughs> I, I guess... I'm probably never going to eat your dish, but I watch your show, you know? Yeah, which I think especially is, since... So, so I have to admit, um, maybe it's a show you are critical of, but I just, uh, two years ago, me and my girlfriend, who is, by the way, by, by the way, French, we discovered Top Chef, and not the French version, which funnily enough we don't like, but the American mm -hmm. version of Top Chef, and I think we watched all seasons in, in mm -hmm. two years, so quite, quite some Top Chef watch. Mm -hmm. But so if you become a fan or, or, or if you look at to in gastronomy and top chefs in this TV way, then like you say, right, mo most people will never have eaten the food of someone and still have a have a fame image. And that changes the profession. And I. I still wonder if, if not, and, and the thing is, you, you are. I, my, my point Sorry. is this or my, my question here at the, the, this point really, really is um I think all, all that you say is super true and makes a lot of sense and fame really can corrupt uh, uh, integrity and, and all that is certainly the the, the case. But the, the initial... So, so now the generation of chefs growing up today probably really sees it as a, way, a pathway to celebrity and that is probably the very wrong motive because you should be... Fame should be a result of great work and not be the reason why you start working. Um, on, on something, especially if it is food related and something, yeah, I, I think we agree on this. But 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 then the first generation who paved the way and to really opened the doors to to big stardom, I think very often I I, I would assume they really saw it as something to to maintain and support their their restaurant, which is a, oh uh, don't is get a tough it business. very important don't get me wrong i don't think tv is a bad thing i think uh, the shows are all valid i think uh, the whole process is good and i think more popular gastronomy is uh, more possibilities we have to have shows like yours for example or to have books like i do or uh, more interest people have for the gastronomy for the right or for the wrong reasons is good for the industry mm -hmm. what i'm saying is that uh, 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 existential crisis uh, that start happening. Uh, I think start happening f exactly for the group of people who uh, develop that process in an organic way, uh, who build a career also organically, and uh, who believe uh, in the deep meaning of gastronomy, mm -hmm. and started to see some things being banalized. So um, I think finding in the middle of this a huge offer of a gastronomy in which some are deep and some others are very uh, superficial. It's like a, a going to a bookshop, you know? You have there uh, some uh, Hemingway and you have probably some book that uh, you just think uh, they don't need to exist because they are just one more book in this shelf, you know? 
yeah, and there sure. are some others that are going to resist uh, hundreds and hundreds of years because they are masterpieces. So I think that's the same way. And I think even the chefs that are not cooking anymore and became a brand, uh, a new Armani, uh, uh, they made uh, their ways not out of superficial things. They construct a whole uh, base of work and people trust them because they have done something in the past that was a uh, so important that and people trust them even if they're not out in the kitchen anymore. So I think that is a way for me. The only important thing is that if someone did a career like that and have a body of work like uh, uh, Massimo Bottura, for example, that is a personal friend of mine is someone that I know very well and I know his the restaurant, you know, as my home. Uh, that is a very classic case, you know. I mean, Massimo is now probably the most famous chef in the world. Uh, been uh, talking to Barack Obama and uh, being in all uh, TV shows, uh, most famous TV shows that chefs never been before. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, he is using now his name to do something that has a deep meaning. He got food for soul that is uh, basically using the, his mediatic power to show that you can change the world uh, uh, using your fame uh, to turn to something good. So I think that uh, is the social element now uh, is so more important because there are people who get have this possibility. That's exactly what I'm doing here now. When people ask me, what are you doing hidden in the Pacific, uh, middle of the Pacific Ocean and the Galapagos Islands. Uh, I came to my existential crisis too, and I said, what I'm doing, I'm just carry on after 20 years visiting top restaurants and writing about uh, great restaurants and promoting chefs around the world. And uh, yeah, that's good. And I will do that anytime I have the possibility because I love doing that. But I felt this moment of a crisis that I say, uh, I want to plant seeds. I want to mm -hmm. do something that have a deeper meaning and I can revert uh, my image and the power that I have in my hands now to do something that can truly uh, change lives and that I feel proud of. And my daughter will feel proud of me too. And mm -hmm. not just because I am a famous name in the gastronomy, you know. Yeah, one one of these famous names in gastronomy that that I I listen to his podcasts is is Dave Chang, and I mean he is one of the key or, or probably one of the best examples of somebody who who built the brand and did all the things that we were talking about before. But 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 he is now talking about okay, look, I I'm looking. He, I think he just became a daddy, and he's talking about this openly, and he says, yeah, exactly. me me too. I'm looking for these yeah. things, and I wonder if all that we are doing in terms of sustainability sustainability and we have the climate crisis what will it mean for for gastronomy and my industry so he is really one of these uh, uh, key figures i think in this industry at least from a north american perspective um, and uh, and he is posing publicly th these questions so what is it what is like the reinvention you are you are talking about you you explicitly in your notes you sent me you, you said reinventing business models during crisis so, so i assume you have some ideas where, yeah. where business models need to go and what is your perspective here i think that um, that is one of my major topics i mean i i i for living, I did and a lot of consultings for business uh, exactly uh, for that reason. I mean, a lot of business when they were in crisis, uh, the point of uh, thinking about breaking or, or closing doors or something was happening. Sometimes they hired me to go there, do a diagnose and to try to come to a plan that can save the business. And so mm -hmm. I was doing that for many years as well. I, I, um, I was trying to, uh, in some somehow, to give some advice to not just to chefs but to hoteliers as well, and uh, what was wrong about your concept or what was not working? Because uh, sometimes, 
when you have a fresh perspective as well, uh, you can see things much better. And of course, I have a lot of experience in, in that medium. So what I see about reinventing is that uh, reinventing is uh, something that uh, I think we have to do with ourselves from time to time uh, in a personal level. And in a business level, too. I think it is uh, the comfort zone is very cozy, but nothing happened there. You know, nothing happened. And I think is, uh, if you want to carry on growing, you have to keep reinventing. Reinventing for me should be something that we should make as a part of our life and our business life. Uh, to criticize what you're doing and to see even if a model is working perfectly, if it is not time to upgrade because I tell you there are some business models that were so successful and people think I don't need to do anything this menu is so successful people are coming here and they come in year after year and I don't need to change a single dish in my menu and they're carry on coming what they don't see sometimes is the impact in image that this restaurant that having 10 years the same menu is going to have is going to come one moment that people are not going to come anymore, or if they are going to carry on coming, they are coming because they miss a certain dish that this restaurant has, but this restaurant is not becoming anymore mm -hmm. that place for uh, that people who are interested in some kind of uh, new experience are going to visit. So the new experience is important in any business. I don't think you have to change yourself completely, but you have to have this element of renewing mm -hmm. inside your life project. So um, crisis uh, force you to reinvent yourself because if something is not working, give you an example. Uh, we are here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, a thousand kilometers from the Atlantic coast in an island where 9,000 people live and we all depend on tourism. There is no other activity here that is not tourism oriented. Mm -hmm. So even the people who are working now uh, inside the, uh, an office or doing something that they don't need the tourists, they depend that tourists will come here somehow to carry on working. So I can say, even though it's not correct statistically to say the Galapagos depend 100% of tourism because there are some activities uh, parallel, but, but depends. Yeah, the entire ecosystem here is built around it. Exactly. The ecosystem here lives from tourists. So um, then comes to the point is we are six months closed. The doors are closed and there are no one single tourist here. Uh, now the flights are open because uh, the airport was closed until last month and uh, there were some humanitarian, uh, you know, flights coming and going. I don't know why they call humanitarian because cost is, is twice as much. But, <laughs> uh, uh, but we came to a, this crisis point and said we have to reinvent ourselves. It's difficult. You don't have the client. How can you reinvent yourself? Oh, we have to sell to the locals. The locals are broken. They are exchanging goods. Yeah. How can you reinvent yourself? So you are in a city like New York. In, I know David Chung, for example, very well. And then, so someone like David Chung, uh, probably he can say, okay, one of my restaurants is not working anymore because... Uh, it used to be a very kind of small, cozy, intimate atmosphere where people were sitting together, sharing a table, for example. Mm -hmm. That concept in COVID time is not going to work anymore. No. I have to reinvent myself. People want to eat my food, but the concept is not working anymore. So I think it is now in terms of COVID, it is a crisis that is very easier to reinvent yourself in the sense of uh, you know what you have to do. But there is one element that is difficult. Everyone is afraid to leave their homes and they don't want to be in closed spaces anymore. So there is a whole industry around the world in crisis because the base of our industry is sharing food, is sharing space, is talking to each other, is intimacy. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and especially in the world of hot cuisine is more intimacy yeah. you know and, and then in particular when you look at it really from a, a business model perspective then i mean the more seats you can put into a place the the better you are off and now you have to make less and less and we all know what a what a challenging situation this is what, what i wonder about so, so okay we don't know when when uh, uh, and and we don't even know if covid is going to be resolved but but maybe there is a world where where in one and a half two years we have vaccines and and the the situation is more under control and the problems you talk about uh, uh, so, so until then it's going to be super super painful but but i wonder if in in, in this particular covid crisis if it is a complete independent phenomenon or is it also in some sense a catalyst uh, for a development that has been happening before because because i saw even before even before um covid i, I saw that some things in the restaurant industry were really really changing so for, for instance one thing that i observed is now really location dependent but in uh, urban areas like i live in munich but it's the same in berlin all the, the, the big cities um you have more and more of these stores who are really specialized into doing one item or one group of items super super extremely well while while back in the days when i was young you tried to have changing menus and display variety but then in, in urban areas where you have it's probably a smart way to become very very good at doing at, at doing one thing but then a whole bunch of a whole bunch of concepts and restaurants are, are suddenly no longer sustainable right and then you have rent increases uh, th- that were happening that really challenged the underlying uh, uh, business model at the substance and covid at least in my reading is also just driving some of this to the to the point where it is now existential but even before covid we had not only the the crisis you described in the beginning was was certainly one part of it but but even then on on a really business level it was not really sustainable yeah I think the COVID is an opportunity for many people as well to use the COVID as an excuse to kind of uh, close business, not paying people, um, uh, reinventing themselves, uh, using the crisis as a bridge as well. I think uh, the COVID is, has accentuated what we are. Uh, I see that uh, great people become greater, much, much better now. Uh, doing incredible projects. I see now that, for example, I'm crowdfunding in the worst time in the world to crowdfund, but I, for the first time in my life, I'm doing a crowdfunding. And uh, I realize, for example, the meaning of generosity that has nothing to do with having money or not. It is, a, it is an attitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, be honest, it's one uh, dollar... Is that something that most Europeans uh, or American people uh, will say, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have one dollar to give to a charity. If you think well, you could give at least five dollars to charities, uh, distribute in five charities and one dollar a year. That will make any difference in your life. And you could save so many different projects if a lot of people would do. So what I realized that uh, uh, in crisis, you are sanctuated to what you are. You are an egoist person, you are selfish. You are basically becoming more selfish because you think, uh, you know, I'm in crisis. I have the right now to save everything for myself. Uh, You are a person with uh, with solidarity in your heart. You become much more Mm solidar. And so uh, I think uh, um, the COVID has showed people that uh, even though we are using masks, the masks were falling, in fact, in terms of philo- philosophic terms, you yeah. know? I think is a, it is a kind of a very ironic thing that is the time that we are covering our faces, but we are showing who we really are now. Yeah. So in terms of environment, I am in a place here. I'm talking to you and I'm looking from the window sea lions who are lying on the beach and they are very quiet and very happy that no humans are here. Mm -hmm. They were very happy. I mean, the ecosystem, Galapagos have a study now that is going to be the proof, the living proof for the rest of our lives 
uh, about the influence of humans in the environment, for example. Leonardo DiCaprio probably is, is very, uh, of course, sad with the COVID, but very happy that he can have data now to show about climate change that is a fact now, in that is no terra planet or stupid person that don't believe that uh, uh, we have first uh, uh, this influence uh, of uh, human actions in the environment, uh, you cannot uh, uh, say that is not scientifically proved anymore. <laughs> in fact, mm -hmm. I think that we should uh, use the COVID experience to stop the world at least one week a year uh, to collect data and to give a break to the planet, you know, I think the same way that we do this, uh, this action about uh, switching off the lights, we should do that uh, uh, for the planet, could be a good action. I don't think the COVID was bad in all ways. I think it was a time for reflection, was a time uh, for uh, being in crisis, going deep into finding out who we are, what we want and what we are doing with the planet. I think it is something that uh, it was coming, and when people say about uh, conspiracy theories, about uh, uh, Microsoft men saying that uh, years before, you don't have to be very clever to know that that was going to happen. I yeah. mean, it was happening already yeah. from time to time. So, uh, but we are so uh, self-absorbed, and we think that we are so great that things like that could never happen to us. But good news happened, and we have to deal with that. You know, so reinventing again, uh, I think it is more in a personal level. You have to re reinvent the way you see things. There is a new normality here. The world is, not, is never going to be the same. We have to accept that. How we are going to live and be happy in this world, that is the world we have now. How can we adapt the things we love, the things we do, our professional, our smile, how we can social interact with people, how we can do conferences like you're doing now using this new normality. I think instead of, you know, stopping complaining, we have to go more and act. However, I'm very skeptical about manipulation because there are some people that are using that platform now to kind of uh, a, a profit, I would say, from this new reality because maybe they didn't have much possibility of uh, exposure uh, in the real world that we were living where the conferences and the things were uh, were live and now they have much more platform of self-streaming than self videos or doing things through this medium so i think we have to be much more critical now about what we listen and what we see than we were before but, but just to get back to to what this reinvention you you are talking about ca can look or manifest itself in the restaurant industry in gastronomy do you have some do you have some models in mind where you think okay this is where really i believe it it needs to go and this is something sustainable that we can create as an as an industry so so b basically talking if you would be yeah. talking to a restaurant owner to a, to a chef what would you say look into these scenarios okay okay i think first you have to analyze who are your clients or your potential clients and you have to analyze a little bit the conditions you have Because I can tell you that the spaces, but maybe you are in the middle of New York in a building and you have no possibility to do that. So uh, I think, uh, first of all, reinventing uh, is very much depends very much of uh, your own reality and the tools you have in your financial situation, too, in, and also finding out what happened to your clients and if you are going to keep your clients or if you have to capture a different type of client. So a diagnose is the most important thing first, is to realize, okay, where I, where am I? Um, okay, I'm telling you about us here, for example. I have a restaurant that is in front of the beach and I have a second space that is in my terrace. So I'm thinking now, okay, I'm going to potentialize my terrace now because uh, I 
think a lot of people are going to be uh, looking for open air spaces and to be more uh, in spaces where they know that they can breathe without the masks. The distance have to be respected. We are very lucky because uh, I think the world of haute cuisine uh, is more lucky in this sense than the conventional, uh, more touristic restaurants because we have more spaces between tables. So many mm -hmm. restaurants like ours don't need to change very much because we have already the separation of the tables with two meters distance in the clients too. So uh, that is good news, you know. Um, uh, in our case, for example, the most, the biggest inconvenience we have is uh, that people need to have a go inside an airplane to be able to come here. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no other way. I don't have any other way to get a client. If the client doesn't go inside an airplane and land it here, they cannot come here or maybe in a boat. But most of my client, 90% of my client comes via airplane. Mm -hmm. So um, difficult in reinventing yourself. So we have to focus now in the whole thing that is going to bring the people here. In the meantime, reinventing ourselves is doing stuff that we believe that don't depend on clients. And that is very bad news because we sell things and we need people to buy it. Mm -hmm. So our case is very dramatic. But I would say the rest of the world that is not in an island in the middle of the Pacific is not living that type of drama. And I think it is possible. It's possible. Uh, I think we have to, first of all, accept that you are not going to have the same income probably for the next two years. I think that is a very realistic scenario that in two years' time, you are going to live a crisis, you are going to have to pay a lot of things that you are not used to pay, and your result is going to minimize brutally. That is a reality. If you want to continue in this business, you have to accept also that it is a whole world of delivery, for example, that a lot of people want to get experience in their homes. I think there is a way for gastronomy to reinvent themselves, creating great experiences at home. Uh, I was a private chef for many years, and I think the world of private chefing is now working more than ever. I talked to some of my friends who cook for celebrities, for example. They are doing more things than ever before. So um, I think that is a new perspective. And I think uh, quicker we, we forget the world the way it used to be and try to look the world the way the, way the world looks now, it be easier for us to reinvent ourselves. So I think restaurants have great opportunities now. And I think that uh, uh, the whole biosecurity norms can be a great tool to make a restaurant more believable, more trustable as well. The way that you take seriously the use of, uh, you know, hygiene norms and you show your clients as well the way you're doing, showing sometimes the way you work in your kitchen, having a camera now exposing that world mm -hmm. behind the scenes will be much more important now. So do, I think there think, is ways that you. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there will be there will be a development? So one of the hypotheses, which is probably a bit contradictory, even that I have, is that we are going to to live through a time of what I call revillagization. So, so while most studies predict more and more urbanization, and I said this by the way before COVID already, but COVID has been a catalyst mm -hmm. for, for this. You see more and more people going remote, and you see in Germany, in France, and and maybe across the globe, people buying countries countryside houses again and going out of mm -hmm. the cities and, and yeah. but, but but i thought for a long time that this is what we are going to see and i see a lot of young people who want to go to the countryside who want to de who want to have yeah. be in contact with soil with plants and who also want to grow grow food so if all this is happening and and at the same time because still we have the urban centers yeah. in this world at these price points so do you think it's mm -hmm. possible that we will see a, a, a massive uh, 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 
reshuffling where all the restaurants yeah. going to the city, I mean, in the 80s and 90s, right? The best restaurants were somewhere on the countryside. Yeah. Then with the urbanization, yeah. everything came to the cities. But maybe we are just going to have much more like farm to fork, longer value chain concepts. And in this yeah. context, m maybe even describe very concretely what, what, what you are doing with, uh, oh, I yeah. forgot to, uh, Muyu, Mu, please pronounce it correctly for me. <laughs> Muyu. Uh -huh. Muyu. Muyu. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think it is. We are we are a great case study for uh, for what you're saying because I'm in a small island with 9,000 people and I can see exactly what you're saying here. Uh, we also have a small farm and uh, and we started during the COVID crisis. Uh, the farm was a little bit abandoned because we didn't have much time and, and money to potentialize the farm and it was a great a project that we are planning for the future and we start to do this now. So uh, I see uh, when we arrive uh, and we, st we started to, to do things, I mean, when we opened Muyu in 2017, I remember to go to the local market here and there was like uh, very few people selling local stuff. There were literally like four or five families maximum bringing their boxes and there was uh, uh, not enough uh, even to provide to your family at home. You know, it was like I have a few vegetables and fruit and I'm selling what I have. Mm -hmm. We start to visit each producer and uh, make agreements with them. And we became the first uh, farm to table restaurant uh, here. And, uh, and it was very difficult because sometimes we, have cli we had clients and we didn't have products. And to make a commitment to the land, to the local produce was here a uh, titanic task. <laughs> very, very difficult. And, uh, and what happened is that you see the way that our actions impact in the environment, in, in the whole uh, way we live, uh, that thanks to us investing so much in this uh, local concept during the COVID, uh, we have the airport closed for almost two months. Nobody could have provisions coming from the outside. Because mm -hmm. the restaurant was closed, everything what we were buying was there to be sold to the population. So suddenly the restaurant indirectly also helped to save a lot of people here from the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, but what was happening is exactly what you're saying, that people start to go to their land and they start to produce. What we are seeing now is a lot of people producing food. I think the work we were doing with uh, the Galapagos Foundation and with Muyu, uh, now uh, I think we gave a, a, a jump in five years ahead. What was going to happen in five years is, going, is happening now in terms of farming. We were very happy in this sense because we see more artisan work. We see more people doing small business at home. We see people baking. We see people more interested in cooking and using recipes in, in, in farming their land. So I think what we are seeing here is happening already in the world. I think people are going to be much more local. Uh, people are going to invest much more in their own land. And I think people are going to uh, change the way they relate to people too. I see mm -hmm. that uh, we were a generation that were um, very um, connected, but very disconnected as well. And I see, I think the COVID somehow gave us time to write to our friends, to be in contact with our families again. Uh, in many ways, was a time of uh, uh, collective therapies as well. We solved problems. Uh, we divorced, we uh, made uh, things uh, in the right ways, you know, and, and, and this separation made us reflect of what is really important for us. So I think what you're saying is, is already happening. Yeah, I, I see it too at, at many phases, but, but going to, to what you just described, what I think is so powerful and here at Holy Tish, our, our topic is not only gastronomy, but speaking broadly about the food ecosystem locally, globally, and how, how it needs to change for various reasons, including, including climate change, but, but, but also other developments. And, and one thing that your story depicts quite or illustrates quite perfectly is the role that restaurants can play in this because they really can drive 
so so a local community but also really help for instance local farmers if you have a restaurant and you it's important to you to work with local producers and and especially if you have some uh, philosophy based around quality and you want to work with very good produce then sometimes you just find no producers who can deliver the kind of quality you are looking for but but many many farmers are super willing to to create quality if there is a market and if you demand it you as a restaurateur really i believe can be a driver of change of course not alone yeah and and, and yeah. a lot needs to happen around it but you can you can really be an important influence and i i remember there is one episode and i think it is uh, uh, dan dan barber um, mm -hmm. in, he, he has this Netflix episode. I, be I believe it was his Netflix episodes, maybe somewhere else. But he shows this little uh, uh, butternut squash pumpkin that he created, where he and he said, "Well, the, the farmer, when I told him I want a small, very tasty one, he couldn't believe it because nobody ever asked him before to to create, yeah. optimize a crop for taste and flavor because it's mm -hmm. so unusual, yeah. right? But yeah, yeah. So, so restaurants can be drivers of local communities. I believe." And what you do, and and I would like that that you the, uh, we already went a bit overboard, but I'm we we are good. We can do five more minutes, and I would like you mm -hmm. to talk about how and, and why you support women in particular in in Muyu and how how you do, do it. Um, I think, uh, um, especially in Latin America. Um, a uh, woman uh, have a greater difficulty, you know, in countries that uh, um, where the position of a woman in the society is 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 a very clear place where women have no voice. I believe that through profession and professional skills, uh, a woman can have a voice in a society. And uh, in what we do in the, in in this project is empower women through a career. I believe that women can change Latin American society if they have a voice and if they become professional. So instead of making feministic speeches uh, in the marketplace and uh, risking to have a man throwing me stones, I decide to uh, give jobs to their wives and empower them here to make sure that they change their own history. So it's a much, much more slow process, but more effective process because it's a combo, you know. The mm. person uh, will be empowered through a new profession, will become a great professional, will discover their own talents, and will be also in a network with other women that will give the hands to them and will show them that they are not alone. Uh, however, I work with feminists, and uh, this, these are men and women, because I think a decent man should be a feminist too, because um, good news for everyone listening, a feminist is not someone who is burning brass in the middle of the square. A feminist is this person who believes in that nonsense that women and men have the same right in the society. Believe me or not. So that is the only thing that should be so obvious, but it is now in the year 2020, still not clear for most people around the world that that is the only thing feminists want, to be treated like a human being, because being a feminist is just evoking human rights. We just want to be paid the same. We just want to have the same rights, the same opportunities, nothing else. We don't want to be better than men. We don't want to be men. We don't want nothing, nothing. Just we want to be treated with respect and to be considered exactly as our fellow males that don't have to fight so hard. I, had, I was very lucky to have a father who was a feminist and who told me the power of education. I remember when he mm -hmm. gave me uh, my first box of books, he said to me, look, you have to learn, you have to invest in knowledge because you are going to have much more work to prove what I prove much easily in this society, which is terrible, but that's the reality. Mm -hmm. So as a woman, you need to empower yourself with knowledge to open opportunities that will be much more difficult because if it will be a man competing, they are going to have easier than you. So uh, that's exactly what we are doing here. Muyu uh, 
is a restaurant, but it is more than a restaurant. It's a project, is a, a think tank of ideas, is mm -hmm. a, a center of uh, hope, I would say more. Uh, it is a, it is not a place, but it is uh, some, I would say, some collective uh, ideas that is starting to generate uh, new projects in the island with farmers. Now, for example, just to give you uh, an example of what we are doing in this crisis, we unite our community because uh, they, nobody has money, nobody has work, and we are in the point of breaking, basically, in closing our doors if we don't manage to, to get through this crisis. So we decide to get the hands together with our, our staff and say we are going to survive this crisis by farming, by doing uh, urban uh, uh, gardens and what they are doing is they are planting and they are uh, harvesting and they are sharing the food and we are cooking together. Now the farmers are bringing some of the produc production that they cannot sell mm -hmm. and they are giving to us and we are producing cakes and uh, bread and marmalades and all kinds of things with a group of volunteers. Uh, who are MUYU staff members mostly, and uh, uh, we are sharing the results with farmers and with volunteers. So that is the kind of thing that MUYU is doing. And uh, we hope that this initiative, even later, when we are in a good place where we have the money to pay for the people, that we will carry on doing things like that. So I think there are opportunities in this crisis to open new ways to do things. And I believe that uh, the important thing now is to survive and to be healthy and to don't get crazy. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Th these are very wise words, Luciana, and I thank you a lot for them. And I, and I also believe you, the, the, what you are describing. So, so first of all, I'm wishing you you all the best. I'm, I'm crossing my fingers for you. you. But I'm also, I, I, I think there is no doubt that uh, you will definitely, you will definitely make it because what you're describing and the way you create this pr product, I, I believe to this day, I still believe in humanity and I believe, uh, uh, yeah, with the right. Oh, uh, I do too. Uh, so, I, I'm a romantic person. <laughs> <laughs> I believe too. So, Thank you very much. I hope that everyone will, uh, after the talk, look at our video and go to our website. Uh, I took my time as well to uh, organize translations, and there is in Germany, in German as well. So um, I hope that uh, people can help us uh, to carry on this project because we are in a situation now that we need help because we cannot manage uh, just what we have here. So to be able to have a chance to carry on this project, we need to move this crowdfunding and, uh, and convince people that any one dollar, one euro uh, is going to be a big help if a lot of people do. And so we... uh, I hope that you can come and visit us here too one day. Oh, I, I hope so too, and I uh, I would love to do so. And we put on the link, so for, for everybody out there listening, if you want to chime in and, and help and support Thank the you. crowdfunding, you look in the in our convention hub, in the gastronomy track, we put all the the links there, and we will also post it again on, on social media. And now, when coming to an end, we will play, you just mentioned a video, and we will play it here live on stream as basically the, the end point of this stream, and therefore the end point of all streaming of holy tish and i'm yeah very glad for your words for your for your wisdom luciana and i hope that we and can repeat this conversation at some point to be very honest thank you i just want to say one last sentence that sure. is not for me but is from my favorite author eduardo galeano from uruguay that say uh, many small people in small places doing small things can change the world that's what i believe now these are the perfect words. Namaste. Holy Tish. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.